Well, in cities like Toronto and Canada's urban centers more broadly, there are constant questions about the infrastructure that is needed to manage population growth and, in turn, what that means for governments and their ability to deliver on long-term goals like affordable housing, better public transit. I want to get some more perspective from Jennifer Kiesmat, who was Toronto's chief city planner between 2012 and 2017, and now runs Collective Marquee, a residential developer that is focused on the greater Toronto area. Um, and you've been talking a lot about this, and you actually just put together something to, to try to address some of these key issues. What's your approach right now? What, what should we be thinking about? So one of the big parts of the conversation over the course of the past year has been around we need to use land better if we're going to deliver housing more quickly. We know there's a lot of land deals right now that simply don't work. They don't pencil because the cost of land was too high in the deal. Those projects are going on hold. There's over 100 projects, housing developments in Toronto that are on hold right now. So there's an opportunity to look at government-owned land and use that land in this moment to ramp up supply and also to, to deliver affordable housing. So in light of Mayor Chow's housing action plan several months ago, we came together with CreateTO, led by Vic Gupta and Michael Norton, and pulled together a team that has created a plan for building a new residential tower within 500 meters of transit on Merton in the City of Toronto. And that was just approved today by City Council. So it's using city-owned land in collaboration with a private developer. We owned the adjacent site in order to deliver on the objective of new housing supply and new affordable housing. Because um, if the if the land is private and, you know, builders are... Like, the big thing that happened over the last year plus was when interest rates went up and a lot of builders of big projects, they have a lot of investors in those projects, all of a sudden some of those projects hit the pause button because of higher interest rates at a time when actually we're still needing a lot more housing. So your idea is, well, look at the government-owned land to get going. Yeah, because the government owned land can be thrown in at zero or at a modest rate, right? The government actually controls that lever completely. So looking at sites where we have underused schools or one-story libraries and figuring out a way to build housing on those sites, which is what we've just done in this project on Merton Avenue with CreateTO, is a way to do that. And look, the Toronto Lands Corporation has over 600 school sites many of which are sprawling low density with surface parking lots. There's a new CEO at Toronto Lands who's also very interested in this approach, Ryan Glenn. Um, you have the Toronto Community Housing Corporation that also has a ton of land that needs to be redeveloped. There's a new CEO there, Sean Baird, who also is very interested in this approach. So we might be about to hit a sweet spot where you're going to see some activity around developing government-owned land precisely because many of those private sector deals are on pause because the cost of borrowing is too high, the cost of land was too high, and they simply do not pencil today. So there's a, I, this, so it opens the door to a, a deeper conversation around how the government can get involved in the, in the long-term housing goals, in this case, uh, in literally using land that they you know, have in, uh, in their name. Um, the other thing we're learning, especially with continued population growth in the country, which, you know, especially whether, whether you live here or you move here and you realize it costs a lot to live here, uh, there's also just the, the complications around <coughs> infrastructure. Um, in, in a city like Toronto, it's getting harder and harder to move around. Uh, we know that we need more housing over the long term, but that's going to equally create a bigger conversation around how are people going to get around. Um, these are parallel conversations. Are they connected conversations, though? Can we be? Can we, should, can well, we look, find they're, a way to they're completely them? conjoined, and our problem is when we separate them. Our problem is that we have separated them, and we need to be looking at creating the walkable, dense urban environments and investing in housing in those environments and infrastructure in those environments in order to get around this congestion problem. Like the places that have, are a big part of the problem is where we don't have access to transit, where there is nothing you can do within walking distance, where people are forced to drive into the city. You know, there's a company called Assembly Corps that is building panelized, panelized modular housing on urban infill sites with no parking. 
in the city of Toronto. And that is a housing type and a housing product that's actually very popular because young people can live close to transit. They don't have expensive uh, condo fees for paying for a pool and an amenity room. It's another housing type that delivers on the possibility of living in a walkable urban environment and kind of like saying, look, like the long commute is out. That's not the approach we're going to take as a, as a country. If we continue to build sprawling infrastructure, even sprawling transit, we're never going to catch up. <laughs> like we can look at other very large cities that have come before us and seen supersized growth. And the only way they've been able to manage that is by transitioning also both how people live, so these different types like what Assembly is doing, but also how people move. People have to move differently. The long commute, it doesn't work in a really dense urban environment. So in the absence of governments throwing big chunks of change on the table for infrastructure, yeah. we can actually plan our cities in a different way. Now, before I let you go, just thinking of big cities, you know, in a, we have a national audience, talking too much about Toronto, but Toronto <laughs> obviously is a big city and it's a big international city now and it is going through these changes and it is changing the way we live. But there are equally, you know, talked about cities like New York, which is the finance capital of the world, where people don't have large spaces to live and oftentimes they don't even have a car. Um, if you think about these steps and how could transition Toronto for the future, is there a big city around the world that you think is a comparable um, one that uh, is worth emulating or, or trying well, to follow Well, look, every time of? we talk about other cities in the world, I kind of get beat up because people say, we're not London, <laughs> we're not Paris. And I'm like, no, we're not. <laughs> but, there's, but there's lessons we can learn and things that we can extract from those cities. Yeah. So if you look at Paris, for example, Paris has fundamentally flipped its modal split. So how many people drive and how many people cycle by really focusing on high quality public spaces and focusing on creating a cycling city. I had the pleasure just before the pandemic of launching Mayor Sadat Khan in London's cycling plan with him because he was focusing on this as the way, combined with congestion pricing, as the way to solve congestion in London. And, you know, an amazing thing has happened in London in the past five years. More people cycle to work. There's a 42% increase in cargo bikes, so moving goods around in the city on bikes. More people mm. cycle to work than drive to work now mm. in London. Something that was unheard of five or six years ago has now become the norm in the city. We've got to think like this. We, we've got to let go of our small city mentality, I would say, in all our big cities. Montreal's doing this really well. Calgary needs to do it. Vancouver needs to do it. All of our mid and big size cities need to focus on this very future-oriented approach which is using land in a different way.